A new era. The Cuban flag flies over its embassy in Washington, making a statement for life. A week after announcing he wants to be president, Wisconsin's governor signs a 20-week abortion ban. City joins in prayer. Chattanooga prays for the victims of last week's terror attack and their families. And Fenway even greener. Famed for its monster green wall, Boston's legendary ballpark now grows vegetables and herbs. Those stories and more on EWTN News Nightly for Monday, July 20th, 2015. Good evening from Washington. Thank you for joining us. I'm Brian Patrick with your News Now. It is a new era for U.S.-Cuban relations. After more than five decades, formal diplomatic ties are officially restored today. Our Wyatt Goolsby joins us from the newly reopened Cuban embassy here in Washington. Wyatt? Brian, it is a historic day here in Washington. For the first time in 54 years, the Cuban flag now flies in front of its embassy here in the U.S. And this morning, the raising of the flag was met with celebration and protest. The hoisting of Cuba's flag marks a symbolic move many hope will lead to a thaw in Cold War era tension. Several hundred people packed the street outside the embassy, cheering as the Cuban national anthem was played. It was especially meaningful to Maria Viviana Delgado, who brought her children to see the ceremony. They never got to meet their grandfather. And my dad came in the 60s, and he waited, waited for this day. Just a flood of emotions. They're hard to control right now. Dozens of people like Maria came to show their support for the Cuban people, but there were also many who protested. Police arrested one man reportedly denouncing the Castro regime by drenching himself in red paint as a sign of the blood of Cubans who have died. This Cuban couple living in Maryland say they are worried opening the embassy will only empower the Cuban president. With this one today, my country is no be better. Uh, only my country better when the communism is gone. This one only benefits for the government, for Castro government, not for the people in Cuba. Today, demonstrators in Miami's Little Havana neighborhood protested as well. Despite the opposition, the Obama administration is moving forward, saying it's time for a change. Today, Secretary of State John Kerry met with Cuba's foreign minister before heading to Havana for the opening of the U.S. Embassy. There are still sore points between Cuba and the U.S. Cuba's foreign minister this morning slammed the U.S. for still holding on to Guantanamo Bay. He also says the trade embargo against his country should be lifted immediately. Now, this is by no means a settled political matter here in Washington either. Lawmakers could potentially make moves to create roadblocks against the Obama administration's policy. Brian? Wyatt Goolsby outside the Cuban embassy. Thank you, Wyatt. Anna Quintana, a Latin American policy analyst for the Heritage Foundation, is with us. So Cuban's foreign minister says the U.S. needs to return Guantanamo Bay, lift the trade embargo, and respect Cuban sovereignty. What does that say about Cuba's willingness to make changes? The Castro regime has absolutely no willingness to make changes. They have not made any sort of progress on human rights, which is what the president said would be the first area that the United States would focus on. There have been over 2,000 politically motivated arrests this year. They have made absolutely no openings to allow for greater religious freedom. Frankly, I, I don't see anywhere where the Cuban government has been asked to make any sort of concession towards the United States, any sort of concession in goodwill. What do you expect the Obama administration to do? Do you think they'll give in on all these counts? On Guantanamo Bay, yes. So really? um, the Cuban government has always said, they said, they've said this for decades, that the United States needs to return what they consider to be their illegal claim over the naval base on Guantanamo Bay. And that is just something that has been a main, main sticking point of theirs. And if you look at every single demand that the Cuban government has made, the president has given in to them. They've prematurely taken Cuba off the state sponsor of terrorism list. They're allowing Cuba to have an embassy in the United States, even though the legality of that is, is to be contested. We don't know if that's legal or not yet. And it just seems like we're just capitulating over and over and over again. So frankly, I do. And we know that the president does want to shut down Guantanamo Bay. What is the U.S. getting in return, or what should it be getting in return? 
See, this is where the United States is getting absolutely nothing in return. And Obama administration officials have said, we didn't want anything in return. We wanted to give into the Cuba. We wanted to give them things to the Cuban government in order to reestablish diplomatic relations. But we have to realize diplomatic relations are one part of the relationship between the U.S. and Cuba. There's still a lot of problems there. So the United States should be asking for greater demands on human rights, free all political prisoners, legalize labor unions. Um, allow for elections. How about we have that? How about just a simple election? How about let the Cuban people decide for once in over half a century their elected officials? How about freedom of religious expression? That's the other freedom of religious expression. Stop jailing the Damas de Blanco. Stop shutting down these, you know, home churches. Stop, you know, stop arresting people for having home churches. So what do you think will happen in Cuba if the government there gets everything it wants with making no concessions? When, when you give in to a dictator, you embolden the dictator, right? So political arrests in Cuba have gone up this year, and that is something we're gonna, it's a trend we're gonna continue to see, because the Cuban government purposely puts, restri purposely puts restrictions on our diplomats. They're not allowed to travel to the Cuban prisons. They're not allowed to travel throughout the island. So they're not gonna be allowed to meet with these folks. They're not gonna be allowed to see what's truly happening, and the Cuban government will continue cracking down on the human rights activists. Well, you're not alone with these concerns. Anna Quintana with the Heritage Foundation Thanks for being with us. Thanks for having me. Now, some of the other stories our EWTN News Nightly team has been covering in today's world. A ban on non-emergency abortions after 20 weeks of pregnancy is now the law in Wisconsin. Governor Scott Walker, who announced he is running for president just last week, signed that new law today. Wisconsin is now the 15th state to ban or pass such a ban. It does not include an exception for rape or incest and it is expected to face a court challenge. Wisconsin Right to Life's executive director calls it an excellent step as we go forward in promoting a gospel of life. She tells EWTN News Nightly, when confronting a culture of death, we as Catholics must do whatever we can to change the hearts and minds and save lives. The U.N. Security Council unanimously endorses the landmark nuclear deal between Iran and six world powers. That resolution, co-sponsored by all 15 council members, was adopted this morning. It authorizes a series of measures leading to the end of U.N. sanctions on Iran. The measure also provides a mechanism for those sanctions to snap back in place if Iran fails to meet its obligations. Israeli leaders are furious over that impending pact. U.S. Defense Secretary Ash Carter, visiting Israel, says it's unlikely he'll be able to change any minds. I'm not going to change anybody's mind in Israel. That's not the purpose of my trip. Obviously, uh, we believe that the nuclear deal promotes the uh, security uh, in the region, um, the uh, American strategy, and also the defense of Israel. But as I said, friends can disagree. Israel is Carter's first stop on a broader Mideast trip. Senator John McCain says he needs no apology from Donald Trump, but other veterans deserve one. Trump's dismissal of McCain's POW experience is just stirring the pot, according to a man held prisoner with McCain in Vietnam. I don't need an apology. I don't think John needs an apology. We know who we are. We, <laughs> we're very well-adjusted people. And, and, and we understand that, uh, first of all, it's just political rhetoric for the most part. It's just stirring the pot. Uh, so I, I, I don't need an apology. In a USA Today article, Trump, who is running for president, says McCain's votes in Congress have made the country less safe. Federal investigators find writings believed to be from the attacker of two military facilities in Tennessee last week. Mohammed Yusuf Ab Al Abdulaziz was shot to death to death, rather, after killing four Marines and a sailor in Chattanooga. Catherine Zeltner reports that Sunday's traditional day of rest there became a day of grief. Sunday church services became memorials for the five victims of last week's deadly shooting. Pastors and bishops joined with people of faith to mourn and warn against giving in to hatred. If we allow anger to creep into our hearts, revenge, then we begin to be tainted by the same thing that we're angry with. You know, do constructive things, build unity between cultures and faith traditions and color of skin and languages. Impromptu memorials have sprung up across the city as residents try to process the events of the past few days. I was shocked. I heard about it and I jumped up and I said, oh my God, what, 
is going to happen next. Meanwhile, video of Mohammed Yusuf Abdulaziz from 2006 has emerged. It was made for a school project, apparently on multiple different religions, and shows him reading from the Quran and praying. His family told investigators he'd recently suffered from depression and bipolar disorder and struggled with substance abuse. Family members from Tennessee to Jordan are cooperating. Officials still say his motive remains unclear, and there's nothing connecting him to international terror groups. In the West Bank, his father's family is grieved by what Abdulaziz has done. All the people who talk with me, they're feeling very angry and very sad about this behavior. Catherine Seltner, EWTN News Nightly. Thank you, Catherine. Banks, banks are back in business in Greece today. Bank doors opened early today after being closed for three weeks. That move was aimed at staving off a collapse of the financial system. The European Central Bank raised the level of emergency funding to banks last week. Withdrawals are limited to 420 euros. That's about $455 per week. Pope Francis welcomes tens of thousands who turned out to see him Sunday in spite of Rome's intense heat wave. Il continente latinoamericano ha grande potenzialità umane e spirituali. Recalling his recent trip to Latin America, Francis noted that continent's deeply Christian values. He also acknowledged the serious economic challenges it faces. The huge crowd endured sizzling heat and oppressive humidity that's gripped Italy this month. Coming up, we visit a member of Congress vowing to investigate the harvesting and sale of infant organs by Planned Parenthood affiliates. And the man behind the undercover video exposing that practice joins us from our EWTN West Coast studio. True compassion leads to sharing another's pain. It does not kill the person whose suffering we cannot bear. From St. John Paul II, it is 1995 encyclical, The Gospel of Life. Thank you for joining us on this Monday evening, July 20th. I'm Brian Patrick. Congressional investigators of Planned Parenthood, or investigations rather, move forward this week. They began after undercover video revealed the alleged sale of organs from aborted babies. Jason Calvey sat down with Alabama Representative Martha Roby, who vows to take action. And this is an organization that has time and time again uh, uh, beat Congress down for um, trying to pass legislation. The pain capable bill, we know, we have scientific evidence that after at 20 weeks um, and beyond, a baby feels pain. Um, and why would Planned Parenthood um, oppose such legislation? Well, for obvious reasons, they want the baby to develop enough so that they can harvest what they call tissue and specimens. Um, these are babies, this is life. Do you think this issue will stay alive through, through the debates and through, through the elections? Well, you know, it should. This is so disgusting. This is so abhorrent. This is a reason to pause and say, who are we as a country that we would let this happen, that we'd stand idly by knowing what we know and allow for an organization uh, to continue to operate this way. Um, these are babies. This is life. And so I do believe that it should, um, it should be an issue for, for these candidates to talk about, at least to, to frame the debate on where they stand on the matter of, of, of life. You've co-sponsored a bill that would defund Planned Parenthood. Do you think this video is going to help in that, in that work? My hope is um, that as a result of this exposure, uh, that Congress will be motivated um, to do all that we can to prevent this organization, Planned Parenthood, um, from, from operating at all. It's going to be hard because they're a very powerful lobby here. They are, but I don't care. I don't care how much weight they sling around this town. The law is the law, and if they've broken the law, they must be held accountable. Alabama Representative Martha uh, Roby with our Jason Calvey at the, uh, the Capitol, and there's likely to be more video released from the man responsible for the undercover investigation, and he talked with us last week. We have David DeLyden joining us from our EWTN West Coast studio in Garden Grove, California. David, your organization put together this undercover video. Really, was it was a result of a long investigation. How long? This was a literally two and a half year long, 30 month long um, uh, investigative journalism study of Planned Parenthood's sale of baby parts. 
Who funds that? On a group of, uh, it was a group of probably about a dozen to 15, just very committed, resourceful people who believed in the mission, believed in the project, and wanted to see it done. And why did it take that long? It took that long because Planned Parenthood's sale of aborted fetal tissue is something that is kept very, very quiet, even among abortion uh, circles. And so if you really want to get a full picture of it, you have to proceed very gradually and very meticulously in order to get the kind of evidence that we obtained. When you started, did you ever think that you were going to be able to talk to such a top-level person and get the information that you got? No, no, I did not. Um, and on, on this network, I'd definitely say it, it, it was the hand of God at work there. Well, now your cover's blown. It's really hard for you to go undercover because everybody knows you. They're talking about you. Where do you advance this from here? How do you advance it? Well, two things. First, we have uh, probably several dozen hours of just equally hard-hitting, shocking undercover video footage with top-level Planned Parenthood representatives. So that'll continue to be rolled out in the coming uh, in the coming days and weeks. And then we also continue to have folks um, inside the abortion industry who are dissatisfied with where they are, who pass this information. So it doesn't just stop with me. We read in the mainstream media and see the comments about people calling you, you know, kind of a vigilante, a, a vendetta against women's rights. How do you answer that? Uh, you know, the sale of aborted baby parts really is not about women's rights. That's about humans, human rights and about, um, about human dignity and not, it, not exploiting people or saying that a child is more valuable dead than alive. Some of the conversation that you recorded in your video, and I'm sure much of the content, is, is very shocking and it can be seen as uh, almost dramatic. That's good television, but does it really have the effect that you were hoping for? Do you really think it's going to make a difference in this battle? You know, there's now two million views on the YouTube video. Two state governments have announced an investigation of Planned Parenthood within their states because of it, and two congressional committees have now announced an investigation into Planned Parenthood's sale of baby parts and use of partial birth abortions. So I think it's definitely having an impact. Well, keep up the good work, and we appreciate you joining us from our new EWTN West Coast studio, Garden Grove, California. David DeLayden, thank you. Thank you. Up next, is the tax-exempt status of groups defending marriage in jeopardy? Some warn it is. And the green monster takes a back seat to a new green at Fenway Park, a rooftop vegetable and herb garden. It's Monday, July the 20th, and today we celebrate St. Apollinaris, bishop and martyr, a disciple of St. Peter. When the Roman emperor outlawed Christianity, the bishop was attacked and killed by pagans. Thanks for joining us for EWTN News Nightly. I'm Brian Patrick, and conservative groups are warning the IRS could begin revoking the tax-exempt status of religious groups over the legal definition or redefinition of marriage. The attorneys general of 15 states want Congress to pass legislation protecting religious schools and other groups. Bills in the House and Senate are gaining momentum. Supporters believe revoking tax-exempt status will be the next round of attacks on conservatives. Critics call the concerns overblown. It's good to have James Capretta, a senior fellow at the Ethics and Public Policy Center, back with us. Jim, let's take a look at a quote from the testimony before the Supreme Court. When asked about tax exemption concerns, the Solicitor General responded, you know, I don't think I can answer that question without knowing more specifics, but it's certainly going to be an issue. I don't deny that. So how legitimate do you think these concerns are? I think they're very legitimate. I mean, who would have thought five or ten years ago that the government would be attacking the Little Sisters of the Poor and other Catholic groups over this whole HHS mandate? No one really saw that coming several years ago. And now that the traditional understanding of marriage has been redefined by the Supreme Court, I think there will be an effort, it could be a year or two or three away, to delegitimize anyone who holds, or any group that holds, a view that's opposed to that prevailing norm now. And that means mainly Catholic uh, groups, Catholic Church, and affiliated uh, Christian uh, schools and other things. So I think the concerns are legitimate. I don't see an imminent, imminent threat, but I do believe it's better to be prepared because certainly it's likely to come eventually. So let's explore briefly how this redefinition of marriage legally at the highest level 
of our government uh, justice system, how that affects religious groups? Well, it could happen in a couple of ways. One would be just the general teaching of traditional Christian views on marriage and family. Someone might be able to argue eventually that that is no longer legitimate in schools and try to press to take away the tax exemption from any institution that does adhere to that kind of traditional view. That would be one thing. Another thing is in employment areas or trying to employ people with like-minded views on traditional marriage. People might view that as discriminatory in, in a Catholic school, for instance, or a Catholic high school. Uh, so there's, I would say those are probably the main areas, but you can imagine the other conflicts coming along. I mean, as long as any organization tries to operate and have integrity around the principle of a traditional Catholic understanding of marriage, that's going to be at odds with the prevailing culture. I think we can see that now. Now, the IRS has been accused of targeting conservative groups before. How do you think that plays into this debate now? Well, there's so much distrust. Uh, I think the, the IRS, uh, there's plenty of evidence that conservative groups were singled out for a lot of scrutiny that other groups were not. Uh, moreover, I think the long-running, still not resolved battle over the HHS mandate has given a lot of Catholic groups and organizations uh, a reason to believe that they might be targeted again for this issue on marriage. So there's so much distrust that the federal government really just doesn't get the understanding of traditional marriage that Catholic groups hold and so therefore will not be at all sympathetic. Very interesting times. Is there any bit of hope that you could put out there? Well, I think the hope is that uh, there is an understanding that if you move proactively now, you might be able to put into the law sooner rather than later a more broad protection because I think the people that have secured this new so-called right in, at the constitutional level may sense that if they press too far, they could overstep their... Uh, their gains here, and so they might grant some religious protection. So I do think now's the time to try to seize it if you can get it. From the Ethics and Public Policy Center, Jim Capretta, thanks for being with us tonight. Thank you. Well, there's more green at Boston's Fenway Park than the green monster, its giant center field wall. The Red Sox are growing veggies at Fenway to give fans healthier, fresher food options. Susie Pinto reports. Heading out to the ball game, never mind the peanuts and cracker jacks, how about carrots and tomatoes? Fenway Farms is a 5,000 square foot rooftop garden on the third base side of Fenway. It's actually on the top of the Red Sox front offices. Vegetables and herbs grown at the century old stadium are being used in concessions and in the ballpark restaurant. So we thought we'd try out a bunch of different varieties to see what the kitchens were using and also to just kind of experiment with what people liked. Teams say they're responding to fans' desire for healthier food. But today's baseball gardens have roots in simpler times. This season, the Red Sox joined the Giants and Rockies in growing greens. Well, this is great because although a lot of people love to come to Fenway and eat a hot dog, some people don't want to eat a hot dog. They want to eat something else and uh, maybe a salad or, you know, a wrap with vegetables in it or something. The company Green City Growers manages the farm and rotates produce according to the season. There's no corn in this field of dreams, but crops will include arugula, green beans, and eggplant. You know, for years we've been using all the local farmers and, you know, making sure that food d doesn't travel too far to get to us. Well, it's ridiculous how close it is now because literally it's about 150 feet away from us right now. A different kind of home plate. Susie Pinto, EWTN News Nightly. Thank you, Susie. Looks good. Until tomorrow, like us on Facebook, follow us on Twitter, watch again on EWTN's YouTube page. For the EWTN News Nightly team, I'm Brian Patrick. Good night and God bless you.